Welcome on into today's edition of PHLY Union Podcast. I am one of your hosts, JP Zapata. Join as always with the lovely Renee Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, we got scheduled for preseason. We got some USMNT roster announcement. We got a special guest here today. But we don't got them signings y'all are asking for. <laughs> but we're here to chat, talk, hang out. Renee, what's going on? Happy Tuesday to you. Ah, it's the second Tuesday <laughs> of 2024. You know, coming, guys. I can see now. Um, it's a whole new day, I feel like. Um, it's wild, actually, outside. Yes. I know I've been hearing that there's some places that are actually closing down early, like a weather, not a delay, a weather it's supposed to be like a monsoon Alert. or something. Yeah, it's it's coastal flooding that I saw and monsoon type. In January? <laughs> in January. Here we are as we're t getting ready to talk about preseason and clear water and soccer. We're also getting, this is this is what happens this time of year. It's just gross. But other than that, I'm great, JP. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited. We have a nice guest here today. I'm excited to talk to. I am. We got some preseason stuff and uh, we get to, you know, bitch and complain about the union roster right now. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, what else could we ask for? It's crazy. Today is one of those days where it's like, wow, there's plenty that we can get into. I hope we're going to go. I hope we don't go over an hour. <laughs> Tyler just shot me a look of death. Every show that we do together, Tyler, is over an hour. Don't you know? Don't you know? Um, that used to be in a cartoon. Do you know what show that's from? Don't you know? Don't you know, eh? No? Okay. I, think I can't of, like, think of the cool name runnings. of it either, actually. Jamaica, Bobby Bob with Bobby. Surfing. What was the name of that cartoon? Best Bobby's Bob. Bob, Bob uh, Bob's Burgers. <laughs> Bob, no. No. Bobby's World. Bobby's World. Bobby's you lost me. Do you guys know Bobby's World? No. Oh my God. See, Renee's got like teachers on a lot of things. I feel like. <laughs> Don't you know? Wait, what year is Bobby's World from? It's a cartoon series from. <laughs> Welcome to the All Season. 1990. Actually. Howie Mandel created it. Okay. Go check it out sometime. Okay. It was pretty interesting. So it's time to talk some soccer, don't you know? That's like one of their like, gosh, I'm so upset at you guys. I just, I bet Jamie might know Bobby's world. I'm going to ask him on the show. So <laughs> let's talk about it though, JP, because let's get it. this last five days since our Thursday show, mm -hmm. I have a quick math in my head, um, <laughs> there's been a good amount of things that have popped off sure. around the union, around the MLS, around the U.S. men's national team, as you were talking about. So we've got lots. Now, specifically looking at the call-ups, I was going to do a really corny line, but I'm going to move on because when <laughs> jokes are not good, I, Tyler and I discussed, you just move on from it. Um, hit that thumbs up button, though. Yes, Comment. Come on, guys. Join the conversation. Let's talk about the U.S. men's national team. So 25 players got called into the U.S. men's national team's training camp for January in Orlando. I wish I was in Orlando right now. Right. Uh, of course, there's a USA-Slovenia game. Uh, that friendly is January 20th. So it's training time. Now, of that grouping, there's been a variety of mixture. There's three players that are from the Columbus crew. 13 are age eligible for the 2024 Olympics of that 25. Um, you also have a number of players that are getting their first call-ups ever. 15 players getting their first call-ups. And if they are all to stay on the roster um, and continue to play, you're going to get 17 uncapped. There's currently 17 uncapped players on the roster. So 17 guys are looking for their first cap. Mm -hmm. Two of them from... Our very own Philadelphia Union and Nate hey. Harriel and Jack McGlynn. Exciting news to see that they got the call. Of course, we know Jack and Nate were called to the U23 team back in last November, I want to say that was. Mm -hmm, That's somewhere right. in mind. Or October. Last October, they made their de debut with the um, U.S. U23 youth team. And now they're getting the big the big chance. I know right. uh, it's exciting. Greg Berhalter has been talking about a lot about the hopes to give that next generation of talent an opportunity and see what they can do. And why are you guys laughing? <laughs> <laughs> We've been called, Tyler. No, I just, I, I gave, been called? no, when you were talking about, uh, you know, them getting the call up and you said Greg Berhalter, I just gave JP a big thumbs. I, <laughs> he's not a, he's not I a hate big Berhalter Greg Berhalter. I get it. 
Oh, yeah. you're not a, a Greg Double G fan? <laughs> no. It's okay. No, he stinks. He cost them points in the World Cup last year. I firmly believe he was a that. huge reason they, they left points on the board in the World Cup last year. Or, I'm, or, I'm not the ago? biggest fan. I just don't know. Two years ago. I feel like, yeah. Last yeah, year? now at this point. No, I'm no. Last, Holy crap. 2022, right? 22. Yeah, uh, the yes, end of 22, two right? Yeah. yeah. Well, Whoa, was it this whatever this it was. December will be two years. Yeah, but this yes. December marks two years, but that's crazy. That was in 2022. It is wild to think um, so anyways, Greg, as we just went left a little bit, was saying it's an opportunity <laughs> to identify and work with the next generation of players who have the potential to make an impact on our program. And of course, these are all 25 guys from the MLS. So also yeah. just talking about the support of the MLS and mm -hmm. the fact that the clubs have been able to utilize this platform and the priority of getting these players as much of an experience in these important competitions and camp and matches as possible. Regardless if you're a fan of Greg Double G, uh, <laughs> still great. And I'm definitely a fan of the fact that Jack and Nate got their chance. Yeah, that's that's the best part about it. I, I do enjoy the January call because you, like Renee said, you get a lot of those MLSers who are had really good seasons. Typically, mm -hmm. it's players who are coming off of strong campaigns. And so they're coming into January to show the U.S. Federation, hey, I deserve a shot here. Look at what I got here. And some of these guys may not get a spot, but like I always go back to like 2019 when Fafa Pico would get called up here. Mm -hmm. Like that was really dope because he was, you know, in, in, in a weird spot with his international game and he wanted to represent for the U.S. So like those moments are definitely cool. And more importantly for Jack and Nate, very deserving. We've talked about it a bunch, the type of seasons that they had and they were yeah. strong pieces for this team. And there's going to be some higher expectations going into 24. And it starts here now with this great competition. You have some of, the best players here in the MLS, some really good role players too. So really hope this brings the best. And, and this is the experience that they can take into spring training because, you know, once February hits, March, mm -hmm. everything is full circle. CONCAP Champions Cup, MLS regular season. Oof. So some valuable experience here. I think that Jack and Nate are going to be gaining here. Oh, well, you're you're absolutely right about that. And also, what a great way to start the new year. Hey. You know, everybody talks about new year, new me. You get a chance to start off new year with an opportunity to get the call up mm -hmm. um, and get a chance to play with the senior team. That's got to feel like a great reward for the hard work that they've put in for all these guys. Again, there's 15 players that are getting their first call ups all together. 17 that are that don't have a cap to their name. So for all of these guys that are the next generation, this is when you, as you talk about, you see that hard work from your campaigns and the MLS and the work you've been doing pay off. And it just is such a also opportunity for like a confidence builder. Yeah. You know, these are the types of things that as a player, you know, you're always working towards what's next and to have a chance to see your name on that list and see, okay, you know what? They're noticing my hard work. They're noticing my talent. You're getting the reward for it. That is something that in itself is very exciting. Um, I know Jose, welcome in Jose. Nice to have you here. You're talking about Jack trying to play his way into Copa America over Olympics. Great opportunity. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the other thing. There's so much to play for. As you know, training camp for the men's national team, January 8th to the 16th in Orlando. Then the friendly against Slovenia is yep. January 20th at Toyota Field. Uh, but as mentioned, there's a lot right now on the horizon for the men's national team in terms of future competition. So great opportunity to really work your way in now. Yeah, this is, if you really want, this is the time now to shout off. And for young players like Jack and Nate, like I said, it's a valuable experience. But now that you are young and you're getting these opportunities, you have mm -hmm. more of the opportunities now to show off what you got here. So hopefully Jack and Nate show off. I mean, Nate, I really especially, like, you saw, I saw more development from Nate this past year. We talked yeah. about just the, the, the load that Jim kind of put on him, playing both sides, even playing center back, uh, taking on some tough assignments, one-on-one, 1v1s, one I'm sure, I'm sure – that's the type of stuff that Greg looked at. And, and you know as well, like, what is a young Philly player? The Federation mm -hmm. knows. Like, okay, we may need to take a quick look at this player because yeah. Philly knows a thing <laughs> or two about development. Yeah, and now you have a chance to go play in the Olympics. You have yeah. a chance to go play in Copa America. You've got CONCACAF Nations League. There's so many things that are coming up. And, you know, they've been in the grind, as you talk about. Mm -hmm. They've been working their way up. And even having the experience of playing with the union and having to step into a new role with the union, getting more minutes, getting more starts, being more of a pivotal playmaker uh, for Jack in the midfield and even for Nate at outside back on both sides. Now you can carry that same, as I mentioned, confidence, but also experience. And it, it only helps on, on all sides. So it helps with your play with the U S men's national team, but also should help with your play with the union that you exactly. now can be a, a player on this team that says I have national team experience. I know we actually talked about that and I mentioned it. Okay. 
when will the union have another U.S. men's men's national team player, not a youth, not a U23 player, a senior team player? Well, they've got two. So, yeah. you know, obviously they already had other men's national team players, you know, representing other countries in Andre and Jose. But now you also have the chance to say, OK, we've got a couple of union players as well on that senior team. So Philly getting represented. Yeah, you want some staples. <laughs> like obviously Brandon has been somewhat of a staple there. And mm -hmm. you know we'll talk about him in a second. But Mark also in and out with the US men's national team. So we want those staples. We want to watch the US men's national team and see the Philly, the Philly players out there, that Philly flavor out there. So hopefully we can get <laughs> don't some you more. know? <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be our trademark now on the show. <laughs> I still can't believe you guys don't know Bobby's world. Somebody knows Bobby's world and it's and it's Tyler and I like, got homework after this. Yeah, go just <laughs> honestly YouTube it right now, Tyler. Listen to like three, three seconds and it'll, it's, it was very entertaining. Uh, but you mentioned Brendan Aronson. Brendan Aronson yeah. finally got a chance to find the back of the net. Yeah. Yes. You know what? These are the things. These are the things. We just want to see Philadelphia Union having success, their players having success in the MLS, but also outside of the league, whether it's in international play or when they move on and are now playing with a European club. We want to see them well, rep re well representing the union right. and not being caught up in stories of you're not playing or you're not getting call ups, whatever it is. So Brennan Aronson finally had a huge opportunity to find the back of the net, JP, and I'm happy for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, I saw the goal. It was a friendly against a club called Armenia uh, Bayfield, Belfield. It's another one of those <laughs> we're going to have a tough time pronouncing, but... When I was watching the play here, I, it, you kind of see what made Brandon Brendan, mm -hmm. making those runs, anticipating the play. And so I haven't been able to watch a lot of Union Berlin. I haven't really been able to watch him with the U.S. Men's National Team. But those were things that were really his bread and butter here, here in Philadelphia, making those big runs and having that vision on the pitch, especially when back in 2020, like we talked about with Kevin Kincaid, the style back then in 2020 was it was very fast, a lot of counterattacking. And Brennan Aronson really was the engine in that. So the play, I hope this is what it takes for Brennan to get out of it. A again, it's going to be tough going back into Bundesliga play. But, you know, sometimes you need that one goal no matter how it is. You know, I, we right now we're, to we're talking over the Flyers with the PHLY Flyers, a bunch oh. of guys who are, are, are on a scoring uh, sled. We, we talked about with Tyler as well. But, I mean, it, it all it takes is just that one gritty goal, and sometimes it just unleashes the uh, a goal streak. But hopefully for Brennan, this is what it takes because he's, he's got the talent. I do think he's got the talent. I think right now for Brennan, it's all up here right now. Yeah, and I do think for Brendan, you know, I've been reading more and more lately of all the different types of uh, things he's been dealing with between his time with Leeds and with Union. Um, and he unfortunately has had his fair share of very frustrating um, all-field issues between Union Berlin and Leeds of dealing with, you know, anti-American comments, fans, um, just not having the confidence, not finding a rhythm, as he talked about. And he was, he's talked a lot about how it's tough, tough it's been yeah. to figure that out. And, you know, it's he's still so young. And I yeah. think we always take that for granted with, especially professional athletes. I was just talking about John Morant, um, because obviously he just suffered a season ending injury and needs to get shoulder surgery on a torn right labrum in his shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, but he's 24 years old. You know, we take for granted because we see professional athletes on our screens and we're following them that they're younger, significantly younger than even us. Like there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot that comes with that. There's a lot of sacrifices. And for Brendan Aronson to be in a whole different country and you're playing between Leeds and Union Berlin with two teams that are struggling and not you know, underperforming, underachieving in that sense. But then also you're getting a lot of that blame. And yeah. there's a lot of people that are wondering what happened to you? Why mm -hmm. can't you compete? Are you too small? Are you not quick enough? Are you unable to play in this at this level? And so the confidence is shaken. And then you're trying to figure out how to find your rhythm within the team. So finding something as simple as a goal, even if it is a friendly, does go a long way because you start to feel yourself turning that corner and getting back right. So I'm very important. I'm I'm happy that Brendan Aronson was able to have that small victory because you do need those yeah. every once in a while just to be able to feel good about yourself and feel like you're moving in the right direction. And you know where you can move in the right direction? That's not up to New York. That's right here in Philly. Brooklyn style bagels made mm -hmm. in Philly. That's Bagels and Co. And they are a mom and pop sh shop feel with also giving you the taste, the variety that you may get at some of the best bagel shops in maybe New York. And what I like about Bagels & Co. is they give you so many options. You have 15 to 20 different types of bagels to choose from daily. 
They've got seasonal bagels. So they had a Christmas flavored bagel, for example. They've got 30 different types of cream cheese variations as well as some sports specific ones, some seasonal specific ones. So yes, they've had Phillies, Flyers, Eagles, cream cheese. Um, and they've had a lot of great, delicious options. Large, fresh bagels. They're they're honestly so great because it's nice to be paired with a sandwich, like my pork roll and egg that I had from hey. them on a rainbow bagel. It could be eaten just with cream cheese. You've got options there. And Bagels & Co. provides meals that now it's not just having the best breakfast. It might be a great lunch sandwich. It might be a great dinner sandwich. So with all that, what makes it even better, not only is it conveniently right in our backyard here in Philly, but they're also an affordable brand. You can get a lot of their food for a great price, which as we know, that is also key. I was just talking to the guys about this before the show. Convenience and price are key when you're looking to make decisions and where you're going to be spending your money. So go ahead and check out the best Brooklyn style bagels made right here in Philly. You can head over to the website. That's the bagelsandco.com. Check out the location nearest you and you will not regret sinking your teeth into a delicious bagel. Now, while you are also focusing on, on making sure that you are eating well, make sure you're also financially planning well for your future with Mortgage CS. Mortgage CS is one of our newer partnerships that we're working with um, and companies. And honestly, they're more like friends at this point. Honest, I'm, I'm so thankful that I had a chance to sit down and talk with them because Ben and Alec do a great job of connecting with you. It's more than just your typical mortgage, um, independent mortgage broker. They are a mortgage concierge ser service based right here in Philly. They're also available 24-7, giving you full control, full access, full insight, and they're friends. Ben and Alec want to educate and empower their clients. They want to make sure they're helping their clients get the ultra-competitive rates. They're also there to just provide overall exceptional customer service that if you need to reach out at any time, you're able to call, text, email, any time of day about anything. And Ben's number on your screen right now for those watching live, for those that are listening on podcast platforms, it's at, you can give Ben a call or shoot him a text at 267-391-7425, day or night, sun, rain, snow, Tuesday, Saturday, doesn't matter when it is, you can reach out to Ben and make sure to have a conversation with him about anything because Ben says he welcomes all the conversations. You can email Ben at ben at mortgagecs.com. Whether you want to talk Philly sports, whether you want to talk about your, your financial planning to buy that future house for you and your family. So check out mortgagecs.com slash P-H-O-Y to get started. And again, when you hear the word mortgage, we want you to think of Mortgage CS. Think of Ben and Alec. And the, the advertisement is not a commitment to lend or extend credit. Mortgage CS is an equal housing opportunity mortgage broker. All loans are subject to credit approval. Certain restrictions may apply. And the company um, M M NMLS ID is 1464766. And you can visit MortgageCS.com for more information. I had to give you that, guys that quick disclaimer so our friends at Mortgage CS can make sure that you are getting all the information that you need. Not this MLS, <laughs> that MLS. All right, that's yeah. an MLS. <laughs> I know. That's why I was, I'm like, NML, NM is a really tough duo. Yeah, I get that. Unless you're saying like the alphabet, LMNOP. <laughs> yeah, but, but, LMN, but, you, but you run it. When you do that right, LMNOP, you, you, like, you... I can't say the alphabet. L-M-N. That's like weird. That was weird. That was challenging. More challenging than it should have been. <laughs> All right. You know what's not challenging? Finding the latest preseason schedule because it's... It's been posted. The Philadelphia Union have finally released the scheduled details, That's JP. Right. We know when and where they're going to be playing. We've That's got right. a lot to circle. Uh, run us through the preseason schedule. What, what we got? Yeah, so guys, so obviously it's gearing up in, in about, uh, we got here actually five days. Everything gets started here. So January 14th, preseason begins, but it'll be beginning here in Chester, Pennsylvania. Then on the 15th, they will depart to Clearwater, and that's when all the festivities begin down in Clearwater. Um, so there will be, before the preseason that we saw before, they announced here today of the preseason game against a Brazilian giant, Flamenco. Uh, that'll be the 21st of uh, of January, a Sunday at 2 p.m. They'll be playing in T in uh, Tampa, from my understanding, where the Rowdies play. Uh, so that, that'll be pretty cool, a historic uh, U.S. site here. Um, and then the Union, after that, will be playing against F uh, Austin FC on the 23rd. On the 27th, uh, NYCFC. 31st, we return back to Chester uh, for in-market training. On the 5th of February, the team returns to Clearwater uh, for, for some more spring training. On the 9th, FC Cincinnati. Not the one we're looking for, but we got a friendly against them on February 9th. 
February 14th against New England Revolution. And then that, that's it. Union will be headed to, uh, San Jose, uh, to San Jose, Costa Rica to face off against Deportivo Saprissa. And then on the 24th at 7.30 begins our home opener, Union versus Chicago Fire. It's February 24th. And I think, that's, if I'm not mistaken, that's actually the first game as well as Philly Spring Training. So 24th of February should be a fun day for Philadelphia. I know. It is. It is. It's a fun time. And it's crazy to look at the fact that this is all happening extremely quickly. Yeah. You know, uh, as you were running through those dates, I mean, it's already January 9th. Yeah. As you mentioned, five days away from the start of, of official training. I know they have to go through you know, the clearances of physicals and everything like that to work back into training. But this time of year is so pivotal. And it's also a lot on these guys that you don't really have that big of a break. And I'm excited to be able to talk to our guest about it when he comes on later, yeah. because we were just ending the season and January 14th, you're already starting back into training. And as we were, you know, as we were even looking at the schedule as recent as today, you get that whole other game thrown in there that okay 21st 23rd but the other thing jp that jumps out at me mm -hmm. and as i was writing out our uh notes for the, what we were going to talk about today on the show it it dawned on me as exciting as as it is that we have this preseason schedule and as exciting as it is that nate and jack got called up it does overlap you know you look at the dates That's um right. nate and jack training in orlando right, you know that has already begun from yesterday, January 8th, all the way through the 16th. Of course, training starts on the 14th for right. the union. Of course, the union, I mean, the um, U.S. Men's National Team has a friendly on the 20th at Toyota Field against Slovenia. And then the union now have a friendly on the 21st. Uh, that is not going to be in at Toyota Field or nearby. Um, that's going to be in Florida. Yeah. Like, this is, this, is, this is where we are right now, that you're having these... Um, overlaps of games already with that you know initial start to the season yeah that's it's, wild it's to gonna me. it's gonna be hectic <laughs> especially for jack and nate uh obviously unfortunately they that's what they're gonna have to do yeah. to go through what the process is for the u.s men's national team but you know before it, before you blink guys the season is here and so this is gonna be important time this is the time that's always critical as well because mm -hmm. when you're talking about champions cup a lot of the teams in that tournament will already be full swing yes. into their seasons. So for the union, you're kind of like all these MLS teams, you're kind of doing a crash course to get ready for the season while these other teams have already had high quality of competition. So the Flamenco friendly, obviously that is something brand new. And so it's a quality opponent. We're probably not going to see some of their big guns. Like I know David Luis, who for a lot of people who don't know, played for Arsenal, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. He's a Flamenco now. Everton, who at one point was the promising prospect of Brazil. He's with Flamenco. I don't think he will be playing. They will be playing. But it's still really good competition because even like the second, third teams of that of a team like Flamenco, it is some really good competition. So I'm really going to be enjoying that. It could be very stressful. But you know what's not stressful, ladies and gentlemen? Our sponsor here today, the Game Time app. Shouts out to the Game Time app. Stressful buying tickets. No such thing anymore, guys. It's a free app. So download the Game Time app now, wherever your app store is. Not only just sporting events, concert, theater, you name it, Game Time app has you covered. Guys, with Flyers, Sixers, and we'll, we'll see how long the Eagles season lasts, best thing to do, head on down to Tailgate, head on down next Friday Live, and right before the game, check the Game Time app, check to see the best prices, and your first purchase, we got you covered. Use the code PHLY now for your first purchase, and you get $20 off. That's, again, the code PHLY, $20 off is the promo there. Make sure you guys check it out. Download the app. Check it out. You guys can see the seats. You guys can see the best prices right now. Make sure you check it out. Thanks again to our sponsor here at the Game Time app. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, yeah, it's it's a very exciting time to start thinking about games and buying tickets. And, you know, I, I cannot believe I had to double check myself because I was like, I know it was about exactly two months, November 25th was when the union dropped the conference semifinal game to mm -hmm. FC Cincinnati. Like and of yesterday. course that's felt like yesterday. <laughs> and then of course, January 21st is when they're going to have that friendly against uh, Flamengo. So you're having nearly an, an exact two month swing of let go of the old jump into the new. And for some, that could be great because yeah. there's no time to focus on last season. Yeah. Like we're rolling to next season. As you mentioned for any international games, 
they're, they're already in a whole different schedule and a whole different part of their season that you now are coming into the start of your season while they're in season form. But then also, as I'm going blind, because something just, I just saw like a fuzzy fly in my eye and it's just, it's fine. Everything's fine. Oh, this is probably because you put the poison glue on your oh, eyes. Hey, <laughs> all right. Josh, we're not talking about that right now. Um, but yeah, I can like see it. It's fine. This is fine. I'm just going to casually just wipe my eye over here. So anyways, Someone thank you, Tyler. Washing. Brother Tyler. <laughs> um, two month swing, essentially. And so because of that, it it does allow for the union to now focus on the, what's next. You know, what does the future hold? What does this season hold? What's what this group, um, even with not having made without having any roster changes in that sense, it actually can help because yeah. it's like you know what we're rolling with the same group. We're gonna just pick up where we left off. It's like a mini holiday break, and yeah. we're back versus a whole new unit where, as some teams that have made you know more roster changes in that sense. This preseason period is let's figure each other out. It's it's different for the union. Yeah. So I I mean I'm playing devil's advocate here on a positive spin that you're just bringing back the same group for the most part. And we'll talk a lot more um, after our guest joins us about the union's off season breakdown in more detail because there's been some some updates there yeah. um, or lack thereof. But yeah, I think that's one of the things that kind of had me a little bit more optimistic with this quick turnaround, that this is yeah. the same group. They know what the focus is. They know what the goal is. They know what their roles are. It's time to just reset. Yeah, and obviously, like, it's it's one of those times, like, kind of is like that, you know, like, like early spring training. You're down there. You're isolated. You're away from family. You're mm -hmm. away from friends. You're with your teammates there. And so it's, it's the start. You're setting the foundation for the season, and it's going to start again here in Clearwater. Some good competition here for the union as well. Like I mentioned, really like the flamenco uh, fixture as well that they were able to set up. And, you mm -hmm. know, they don't really often get these type of fixtures before the season as well. A club like flamenco with the stature that they have had, and it's going to be a great com uh, competition to to start off this year for them. But uh, I, I love it. I always love as well the um, like the clips that they give, like the social media clips that they give. Oh, yeah. All like the bloopers and outtakes and everything. <laughs> But um, one thing I think I speak for the whole entire fan base, MLS Union. I don't know who I need to speak to here, but if we oh could just get boy. a little stream, I don't care how the quality of it is. We, I don't care where the cameras. Let's just <laughs> see the action. A lot of us <laughs> would like to see it. You know, I know, and you know, NFL fans can watch hours of preseason football when it's preseason time. We just ask for a little stream. That's all. That's all I'm asking for. You don't care where the camera angles from. It could be it could the be aerial the view. It could I mean, be. Renee, but like <laughs> with how scarce it's been to find action for preseason over the past couple of years, I will take whatever I can get. JP, give me like 20 bucks. <laughs> I'll go down there with my phone and I'll just, I'll like run the sideline oh, for 90 wow. minutes. Can I you might imagine be, literally running the sideline? I, I might be dead by the time the game's <laughs> over, but we'll, we'll, we'll get you some, we'll get you a feed. Passed That's out, good. still with the camera up. But literally, it, but like, I know we're joking, but like, it's how hard is it to just put someone with a camera there to just go. I don't, I don't know if it's like a, like a, like a, a copyright thing, but like MLS, you own the rights to your own product. <sighs> I don't know these don't closed this closed friendlies and preseason games are. Fans want to see that stuff. Fans do want to see it. They do at least make it so that they can be there. At I don't know. I don't know. It's just so weird. I it is know. weird. But listen, we've got a great guest on um, that Absolutely. I'm sure might be more fit than you, Tyler, and able to run up and down the sideline <laughs> to maybe record the games or even want to jump in the action. So we've got Tesho Akindeli joining us here from Charlotte. Former professional soccer player that played with uh, in the MLS for years, played with FC Dallas, played with Orlando City. Listen, the accolades for Tesho, as we're uh, getting Tesho joining us, are so long. Goal scoring machine is what I have. Played four years of college soccer at the Colorado School of Mines, where he was the all time goal scorer uh, with 76 goals, four time All American, was ranked second in the nation in goals back in 2012. Um, and outside of college, once he was done, he continued that goal scoring into the MLS and continued to be uh, a phenomenal player drafted in the first round in 2014. I remember that MLS super draft because actually I was coming out of college at the same hey. time. Um, but there he is, the goal scoring machine holding some records, including at one point he held the record for fastest goal scored in the MLS 33, 31 seconds, excuse me. Scored into a game that was back in 2021. I'm interested to know that goal, that goal record still stands. But welcome into the show, Tesho. Pleasure to have you here on PHOIU podcast. 
Sasha? Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, we are talking right now a, a lot about the offseason and just the challenges of that quick turnaround for the Philadelphia Union specifically, but for every team in the MLS, it's been a couple weeks since the last season ended, and it's a couple weeks until you're getting right, and I'm sorry, a couple days now until you're getting back into training. So as someone that's been there, you know, what is this time period like for a player where you're trying to manage how much you're prepping for the upcoming season, resting, spending time with your family, and just juggling all of these different things in a very quick off season? Yeah, I mean, the typical year for me would be like when the season ends, I'd be like two weeks of just nothing at all. You know, like I don't work out at all. I probably eat way more than I should be eating. Like I'm just like full on relaxing. But then then you start to get back into it. And if you think, I mean, like a lot of obviously everybody who is in the off season right now or professional athletes who like working out is just built into part of who you are. So after two weeks, like you just start to get that itch, you know, and you're like, all right, like now it's time to do it. Um, but sometimes it can be difficult, you know, like look at the roster of Philly Union or any team in the league. People are all out from all over the place, you know, so some guys might be in Philly, but a lot of guys might be home, whether it's a different state or a different country. You know, so a lot of people may be working out almost in a bubble, like by the, in a bubble, meaning like you're kind of running laps by yourself. You know, like I would be sometimes in Dallas in the preseason, just there in the cold sprinting on the field by myself. So after a while that gets tiring and it's nice to actually get back into preseason with the guys where instead of like sprinting around by yourself, uh, you're actually, you know, in the battle again with, with your friends, being able to joke around and actually play some soccer again. Hey, Ch Tesho, uh, JP Zapata over here. I wanted to ask you, cause a lot of the topic of discussion this past season for all players league wide, it seemed like was the amount of matches played. Obviously leagues cup was introduced here. Just curious about your take, and if you were preparing for this upcoming season, knowing League's Cup is back, how would you prepare? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would if I would prepare that differently up front. I think it's more of like a man management thing during the season. You know, like obviously when you're preparing for the season, you're gonna try to get as fit as you can, as healthy as you can. There's there's not gonna be really any difference. I would just say it's kind of up to the teams to um, manage their players, and you know, so like for me, I mean. If you look at how many games MLS teams play compared to European teams, like the European teams are playing a lot of games too. You know, I, I guess the argument could be that there's there's a little bit more depth of roster. And so maybe that's something that the league might need to address. But for me, in terms of like number of games, I, you know, I don't know if it's too much because it's kind of like standard for for the, the world. But it might just be like too many games put on two, on individual players, you know, whereas in Europe they have squads that they're kind of rotating through people a little more. Yeah, that's a great point. That's honestly a lot of what we've been talking about is to keep to adjust and keep up with the soccer world to have more games to have more in season tournaments and international games requires more depth, you know, to change up your roster to allow, you know, for more players to get those opportunities versus it all being on a small group of players in terms of minutes and just logging game after game. Now, for you also, uh, as someone that's a goal-scoring machine, haven't been retired that long. I'm sure you could still find the back of the net if it puts you on a pitch somewhere. You know, a lot of a lot of what we've talked about for the union, but there are other teams that are in a similar boat. It comes down to goal scoring. I was a goal scorer myself, Tesho. I always tell people it's not an easy thing. It's very hard to score goals. Anybody can score goals, but not anybody can be a goal scorer. So the mentality of being a goal scorer. If you're looking at a team like the Union or anybody else in the MLS trying to take that next step to get their offense going, where would it start for you? What do you think is most important for a player or an, a team to really be able to refocus and figure out how to get their offense going, putting your coaching hat on in that sense? Yeah. I mean, teams like Philly, I mean, obviously Philly's been a good team for a while and they've, they've scored goals, you know, so I think the guys there know how to do it. And they've also had like multiple people score double digit goals, I think. A few times so they, they have people on their team that are quality uh the goals can come from all over the place but i think you know whenever whenever those moments because teams through seasons might go through ups and downs of scoring it's just about really tuning in and being sharp in in the finishing you know because you get your chances and if you're kind of like ah oh, man i wasn't really ready for that one like you only get that one you know mm -hmm. so it, being a striker is really about like it might be the whole game and you didn't really get a touch of the ball but 90th minute you, you get it you got to be ready, tap it in or shoot it, whatever it may be. So just staying focused. And that obviously starts in training too. At the end of, at the end of most training sessions, you might do a finishing drill. So how are you approaching that as a player? Like, are you 
kind of relaxing, toning down for the day? Or is it like, all right, I'm a striker. This is my time to lock in, uh, show myself what I got, show the coaches what I got. And so I think that mentality starts in practice and can hopefully carry through to games. Tasho, I mean, we are a Philly Union podcast, so we have to ask <laughs> any good memory stories you got for us playing against the Philadelphia Union? I mean, even before I got drafted, so I, when I was at the Combine, same year as Andre Blake, he was drafted number nice. one overall, same year I got drafted. And um, so I came from a Division two school. No one knew me. The Combine was my chance to make it. You know, the first day I scored a goal. Second game, I was playing amazing. You know, a lot to hide myself, but I was playing amazing. And I was beating defenders, shooting it. And this guy, Andre Blake, was just robbing <laughs> me left and right. Like, I, I, so I couldn't score. I had, like, four that – I left my foot and I was like goal, you know, and you, you know how it is. Like when you shoot it right nice, you'd think it's a goal and he's, he pulled him out. So that's like <laughs> the first, you know, that was before he was even at Philly, but, and, and you guys have seen it more than anyone else that this guy is just a different level of, of goalkeeper. So he robbed me, man. And, and another thing I guess about Philly too, is just the consistency of their style of play. It's, it's like, you know how they're going to play. And a lot of times you know who they're going to play and you prep for it the whole week. And then, like they still do it to you. Like you're like, all right, this is what they're gonna do, to, and they still do it. So it's kind of like it could be frustrating sometimes. But I think that just speaks to uh, the quality of the players, even from from the coach, from Jim Curtin, to the belief in his system, and to be able to like they go in a lot of different situations and impose their system on people. Um, so that's kind of two nuggets of my my thoughts of Philly. I love that. I love I that. Like yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so much has changed since 2014. Um, 2014 clearly was the best year. Let me just throw that out there for <laughs> all soccer players coming out into the into the next into the pros. But a lot has changed for soccer overall. NWSL, MLS, U.S. soccer. Obviously, you also have played internationally. You played with the Canadian national team. Um, you you have seen it all from from a variety of different perspectives you know what have you enjoyed most about the growth of the game as someone that's been a big part of you know key memories and moments in soccer i think just watching the quality of younger players as they start to come up and being like wow you know these kids are really good so my last year in orlando for example we had a couple guys that were like 17, 18 years old that were, they're just amazing players, you know, and, and they weren't even sniffing the first team. So, and there's, there's players like that in Philly too. Cause I, I know they have a really good academy system. Um, the professionalization of the game from a younger age in the U S is, is serious right now. And these kids are beating, like, I don't know how much, how much like the fans are, are paying attention to what's happening in the academy, but they're beating European teams. Like when they do tournaments, they're beating mm -hmm. like the Manchester United. So like Philly Union is like beating Man United in tournaments. And that's that's serious. So I think just seeing the growth of the game from like the academy kind of started when I was 16 or 17. I, I never even played in the academy. So now it's like you you're in the academy, you're in a professional environment from the time you're a kid. Your mentality is professionalized from the time you're a kid and it's producing players that are just unbelievable you know so like like i was saying last year i'm at i'm playing and there's these 17 8 year old 17 and 18 year olds just doing just ridiculous stuff and i was like all right you know maybe it's time for me to to, to move on and pass the torch down to some of these younger guys because they're amazing so I, i'm excited like and I, i've really enjoyed watching the game as a fan now too this this first year out of it just the quality has, has gone up and up every year Tesho, um, so recently I just watched the Jason Kelsey uh, documentary, and there was a lot of talk about retirement. So I kind of wanted to ask you, someone who went through that, kind of like what's the most challenging thing about going from a professional athlete to retirement, and, and any advice you would give to a professional athlete going through that process as well? The most challenging thing is finding time to work out, honestly, <laughs> because like <laughs> when you're a pro athlete, you, you never have to think about it, right? Like your job is, is working out, so you never had to work out on the side. Versus now I have two kids, I have a wife, so I'm waking up, I wake up at like 4.30, I go work out at like five o'clock in the morning, you know, so that's that's been one thing that's been difficult. Um, I think honestly, I, I did a, a good job in my transition because I, I had some passions outside of soccer, you know, I started, um, I was in, interested in real estate um, investing, real estate developing, which is what I'm doing now, I work for a real estate development company. And I just, while I was playing, I got really passionate about like the impact I could have on the world through real estate development and just building better neighborhoods, making the world a more walkable place. And so that would be my advice to players is find that passion, like find, find what that thing is. And, you know, if you have like an idea of what it might be, find someone in your city who's doing something like that and, and invite them to meet up. So if you're in Philly 
and you're interested in real estate, just Google like who are the best real estate developers in, mm -hmm. in Philly and call them up. And a lot of guys, like, I think they're nervous to do that, but I always tell them, think about it from the other side. You know, think if you're the developer and Andre Blake calls you and is like, hey, I would love to get a coffee with you. That guy's taking that meeting all day, you know? Oh, yeah. So I would encourage players to just, um, just reach out to people in their city who they think are doing <clears throat> interesting things outside of soccer and just expand yourself as a person a bit. I, I like that answer. I, first of all, I agree. I think I just can finally admit I've gotten to a point of consistently working out. I kept procrastinating for the longest time because it is different when you're used to having a training regiment and coaches and a training environment that your um, exercising is not forced. You're just doing it just because you want to, you love what you're playing. But now as someone that's retired and you touched on this a bit, I do want to talk about life after soccer for you. Not only did you become the first MLS player to graduate from SN SNHU during that partnerships uh, launch, which congrats, that was awesome to see. I, I looked back on that throwback video of your uh, graduation. I love that moment. But you also, as you mentioned, have been working as a real estate developer, working with Camp North End. You're working in as um, someone that's actively involved with urbanism and developing and helping the community. A lot of people may not even understand what that all all that entails. Mm. You know, as you talk about creating communities that are more bike friendly, walkable, you know, just allowing families and people to be able to have the the lifestyle that they should. You know, what inspired you to take that step and what have you been doing um, just to give people an idea with all the work with Camp North End? Yeah, so like to reverse a little bit when I was you know, thinking about what I wanted to do after soccer, I was interested in all kinds of things like real estate, which I was doing. I was interested in, in personal finance, in affordable housing, in um, education, because I have two kids. So I was interested in kind of education, the environment, all these things. So it's like, I can't work in all of those. What, what can I do? You know, but then I started talking to some people who were real estate developers and uh, I read this book called Walkable City. And it really just explained to me that like real estate development and the way we build our cities impacts all of those other things I was interested in. So it impacts affordable housing, it impacts diversity in neighborhoods, it impacts public health, like people are healthier and more in more walkable neighborhoods. It just it just is the base of a lot of things. So I got really passionate about like, man, I can have an impact on the world by trying to, you, you know, you develop buildings and neighborhoods and then like let people thrive in that situation. So I got interested in that. Um, and then here in Charlotte, I'm, I'm doing just that. So Camp North End, we have a 76 acre property, which is just one mile away from downtown Charlotte or uptown Charlotte, they call it uptown <laughs> here. Uh, one mile away from uptown Charlotte. And, you know, we're building 2000 apartments, we're building office space, we're building restaurants, we have like public space. Um, so it's just, it's really like we're building a neighborhood from scratch and we're trying to bring just kind of the best of Charlotte culture to us and give it a place to thrive. And I love that I have the opportunity to do that. And I got to take my kids there, you know, like I take my kids there all the time. And it's like, yeah, like your dad is, is part of this project and, and I get to feel proud of it. At the same time, we drive past the Bank of America stadium where Charlotte FC plays. And my son, he's like, you don't play soccer anymore. And he's like, I'm going to play soccer now. So <laughs> he awesome. rubs that one in my face, but I can, I can take Aww. him to Camp North and say like, I don't play soccer anymore, but I do this. So. Oh, I, I, awesome. I love that. I love that. My last question for you um, clearly in everything you've shared from just your experiences and even the things that I saw um, that I kind of read up a little bit more about you outside of what I already knew is the fact that the consistent theme is you're a game changer. You make an impact in everything you do, whether it was finding the back of the net or being able to create a better community. You know, how has soccer, I love the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a nostalgic person, so I just have to ask this nostalgic type of a question. How has soccer helped you be a better person and just have a greater appreciation, whether it's as a father, a husband, a real estate developer, a retired soccer player, whatever it may be and all the different hats you wear, how has soccer really helped propel you in what you do? There's just, there's so many ways. I mean, even starting from the time I was a kid, you know, soccer and sports in general just puts you around a lot of different types of people from early on, you know? So from the time I was a kid, instead of just hanging out with people from my school, I'm hanging out with people from all over the city who some have way more than me, money than me, some have way less, they're from different countries, speaking different languages that carried on to college. And then in the pros, it's it's another level, you know, like half of my team when I was in um, in um, Orlando or, or Dallas is from different countries speaking, I think 14 different languages or something on teams that I played. So like, you just get, it, it's amazing the types of people you get exposed to. And then another level is just traveling. 
So obviously like we played in Philly, we played in LA, we played in Seattle. So I got to go to like the best cities across the continent or across the country. And then for Canada, I got to go to every single country in Central America. So soccer gave me the opportunity to travel in a way that I wouldn't have. Um, and then w one more thing is just being in, you know, high pressure situations, I think has helped me kind of, you know, a lot of people talk about mental health in sports and how mm. it's difficult, but I think it's actually helped me with my mental health because I've been through situations where we did is tough and we won or like I've missed a PK in my career, you know, and so the whole stadium watches you miss a PK and it's the worst feeling in the world. But like, here I am, I made it. And to like, see that you can go through those things. I think it's helped me like become a mentally stronger person as well. Um, I can go on and on, but I, I, I love, I, I just love the, the amount of impact the sports had on my life and what it can do for other people as well. We absolutely love that, Tesho. Uh, real quick, we just want to thank you for taking some time out, spending time talking to us, giving us a perspective of the of the player, and we just want to throw the open invitation. Anytime you're in Philadelphia, please come on by. Definitely. We'll take a walk. We'll grab some good <laughs> food around here. You know, Philly's known for food as well. So, Tesho, thank you so much for joining us, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. And Philly, you know, I was talking about walkable cities. Philly is up there as a, yes. an amazing walkable city. Ah, so yeah. I, I love I love that style of development that you guys have over there. <laughs> I will, I'll be over there. And I'll, I'll be sure to come to the studio for sure. Sounds Looking great. Forward to it. Thank, thank you, you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. So we had Tesho on the second Tuesday of ah. 2024 on the tees. And I'm not going to lie, some of his answers were putting me in my field. So I'm like, dang, I He's feel that dude, all too personally. Tell. He does seem very cool. But I was like, man, I feel that so personally. The exercising. And then I was getting a little emotional. He's talking about all that soccer has like exposed him to. And I'm like, me too, me too. <laughs> I was like thinking back of all the people that I've met and the doors it's opened. And, For sure. And then even the fact that sports, I know I'm extremely competitive and I hate losing. But the, com the competition side of being an athlete has helped propel me in so much in life. Yeah. Like, I fully do understand life more because I understand being a competitor. Yeah. And what it's like to have that pressure and the experiences and game on the line, overtime, balls at your feet, and you miss. Or you score. Like, I, oh, okay. I but just got pumped. But losing humbles you as well. And it it's does. Some, like, sometimes people do need stuff like that, like, just go through that. But, like, losing, like, a big game, like, there, especially, like, if... Losing a big game and you were a big part of there. Like you had like that play. That I just... still vividly remember several games. I didn't lose that much though, actually, in my career. But there's no way that was gonna happen. No way. <laughs> in my entire like in all seriousness. But I really do remember key moments where I'm like, I should have made that shot. I should have made that pass. I, I should have cleared that corner. Like it, it does stick with you. But as you mentioned, losing is just as valuable as winning, I guess. That's what my parents tell me at least. So. <laughs> I'm trying. That's what I'm trying to figure out still at in my 30s. All right. Well, that being said, uh JP, we are nearing the end, but not done yet. Save the best for last okay? guys. The goal is to get out of here in under an hour. We're still on track. Woohoo! <laughs> but we could easily derail this bad boy. No, I'm just kidding. So let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about the piece that came out for the MLS. And that's funny. I typed in my notes MLB. That's clearly my head to that. <laughs> MLB MLS that Matthew Doyle wrote about yeah, to Doyle. just kind of like the state of where every team is on the for both conferences and starting with mm -hmm. the Eastern Conference. Uh, a breakdown looking at their offseason so far looking at moves that have been made, moves that are expected. Um, the one thing that stood out that I wanted to start with is just taking a look specifically at the breakdown of the current depth chart. Yeah. So I know we've talked about this and wanting to see this. And of course, we're looking forward to seeing what this looks like eventually, if it ever gets updated and there's some new roster additions or mm -hmm. changes in that sense. Uh, but this was an, a look at the current depth chart as of today, January 9th, 2024, from what we know, mm. of course, there are question marks in there because those are things we don't know. Yep. Julian Carranza, Kai Wagner, Ali Badoya, Perea, question marks and goalkeeper in general. <laughs> so this is what we know, and there's still a lot we don't know. Uh, but what jumped out at me was, okay, there's two, three names for each position mm -hmm. that I feel very confident in. Um, but I still would like to see, I still feel like we're missing pieces. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was an, it was an interesting piece only because I thought there was some very telling stuff and we're in a place in the off season where we're just itching. Like we just want some type of news, even if it's a mm -hmm. rumor of an exit, but 
it really does feel like Renee reading this article, and I kind of felt the same way beforehand. Was it feels like we have to wait for some dominoes to fall. So yeah. kind of to break this up. So obviously the two free agents that we all know, Alejandro Bedoya and Kai Wagner, we got to wait to see what happens with that. But there's also three players that are on the roster now, but could potentially be exiting. That's Julian Carranza, Olivier Mbaizo, and Leon Flock. I think we have to wait to see what happens to those those mm. do dominoes that I mentioned. And I think at, after that, we will then find some pieces to add into the depth chart, depth chart that you are looking at. But... I think by reading this, Ali, I think he's back. I, I just don't see the way he doesn't come back. I think that's surefire that that's going to happen. But it does feel like at the moment, the Union are back and that Kai Wagner comes back. Because we're not hearing any rumors of a left back. It looks mm -hmm. like, according to this as well, we are the favorite as well to sign him. So for Kai Wagner, what it comes down to is, do I chase the European dream still? But I'm getting older. I'm not getting younger. Do I still go chase that bag? My last mm. big bag potential that I can potentially get. So that's really something to look forward. Caranza, I talk, we talked about it before. I think he's he's got to go because I, I think right now you got to strike on that value, get some, get a replacement. <clears throat> and buys is a tough piece because that's more family needs to be yeah. here. Like you, you you sympathize with that. And Leon, it, it is tough though. But for right now, Renee, it feels like we got to wait for some of these dominoes to be all these questions to be answered before we start bringing in some more pieces into this team. Yeah, yeah, I know in this piece, it did make a lot of people very interested, For sure. depending on which side of that interest, good interest, bad interest, <laughs> it's up to you, with the fact that the wording is literally saying, and as of now, both Wagner and Bedoya are free agents, of course, within MLS and the larger world of soccer. The latest reports say the union are favorites to bring both back for 2024. Heavy favorites in the case of Bedoya. We like that. We like to read favorites for Bedoya, heavy favorites for Bedoya. Um, as you talked about, though, when you look at that depth chart, these are pieces that, okay, if Kai Wagner is not coming back, I know I just read that he's listed as a, we're listed as a favorite for the destination to still be here in Philly, but if Kai Wagner does not come back, if Mbizer does not come back, your outside backs, Matt Rial, Nate Harriel, um, Bedoya, if that signing does happen, even if it does, if we do get Bedoya back, your midfielders still are missing a, a true attacking center mid. I know Daniel Gazdag is that, but you need that true Ma Jack McGlynn, um, Jesus Bueno, Jose Martinez. They're great possession guys. They're great box to box players. They're great at switching the point of attack. Who is that true offensive threat out of the midfield that's facilitating and, and playmaker and making runs? It should be Daniel Gazdag, but I don't think he's that. I think he's more of the traditional, just central. Um, yeah. In fact, possibly needs to be playing more of a striker role anyways. And then uh, and then you also have up top, if there's no Julian Carranza, that question mark gets moved from the board. Okay, we're looking at Chris Donovan, Ty Baribo, Mikhail Ua. The list is very thin there as well. So looking at the depth chart and looking at uh, what we know and what we don't know, I'm assuming and feeling confident that there's been plenty of quiet conversations happening. For sure. Uh, but it just seems as though we're not going to get, as we keep mentioning on the show, any real move until we get later into January, possibly February, is what it's looking like. And Renee, you know what the most shocking part of this was? The last paragraph of this of the <laughs> Philadelphia Union portion. So I'm going to read it word by word. So it's about Mike Alura, which I know a portion of this fan base is ready to move on from. But... While I haven't heard anything about the future DP striker Michael Ura, it wouldn't shock me if they found a way to move on from him and open up a chance to bring in a more multifaceted performer at that spot. Mm -hmm. So listen, this is an obvious, like this isn't a report. This is Matt Doyle, who is a well-respected MLS writer, putting out his opinion. Um, and it is, I will say though, based off of rumors and Pop, you know what he's heard from other people like right. he's not just making stuff up right that is a big important piece of this disclaimer of like matt doyle is taking what he's heard and compiling it to figure out how it, what this all means that's a juicy part like and like thinking about it like i'm in the i'm in the ballpark where i'm giving him the season for him to figure it out and that's it mm -hmm. if it's not if, if we're not getting the goal production from him then we got to part ways with him but it is very telling. And I don't, now that I'm reading this, I don't think I would be so shocked if the unit surprisingly move on from it and then try to find two new strikers. I mean, I would, that's not, that's not what you want to do, you know, two new strikers before this season. But 
I mean, like, can you justify Ura, like, staying? Like, can you, like, solidify defend him and saying, like, he needs to stay? No. Because, like, I genuinely cannot. But that last paragraph was extremely juicy and very telling to me. While I haven't heard anything about the future right. of DP striker Mikhail Ua, I mean, hmm. Th that, to me, also means that there's possibly not only, like, let's flip it. If you haven't heard anything about him, that means there's no interest. Because in this same thing, we have heard him mention, and this is not the first time we've heard this mention, of course, the interest for Leon Flock from, like, Werder Bremen. Yeah. And NYCFC has interest in Andres Perea. We've been hearing teams that are interested and the clubs that, are been, that have been essentially, I get the vibe of reaching out about these guys, looking to talk to their camp to see if, if we can possibly figure out a trade that works. Or how we can sign them. So Ernst has been but shopping if, him, you think? But if, if there, if you haven't heard anything about Ua, to me, that means no. That's interesting. Not only has he... Okay, I don't want to use too many negatives. He has not been shopped, and there has not been interest, is the vibe that I get from that. Because if you heard nothing, like, we didn't hear... I don't know. I mean, I may be over-analyzing it, but to me, it comes across like there's not... It, we're not getting interest on either side, which makes sense, though, because when you look at this last season in general, he was not really a factor. I a mean, he finished with yeah. in the regular season, nine goals, four assists in 33 games. But it was it was a very quiet season from him. It was very inconsistent after having 13 goals, six assists a season before in the regular season was just not really a force. But I could say the same about a few people. Yeah, I mean, I can deal with the regression in the regular season, but it's back-to-back -back playoffs where in the yeah. game where it was do or die, where were you? A and that's that's my yep. main issue here. And so that's why I'm not surprised here. This is why it's a make-or-break season for me. With, when because it comes in to six playoff games between 2022 and 2023, now, this is, this is, you're right, this is a great point, JP. In the six playoff games that Ua played in, in the last two seasons, one goal, one assist, yeah. 16 shots, only three of them shots on target. You know I love shots on target as a stat. It's hard to defend that. It's hard to defend that. Yeah. So in big moments, that's, that's the big moment. Seasons on the line, we're expecting our top players to lift top us. Top contract. To win top contract, highest paid player on the team. And in the postseason, not someone you could rely on to help you win games. Yeah. So I do think it's this piece. I mean, listen, all this was was just summaries of what every team is, has done and what's next and what their current depth chart looks like as of today. And, of course, we're still going to be waiting for some time for the union. All we're saying is keep an but, eye on it, guys, and don't be surprised. Yes, don't be surprised if we get some possible movement uh, within some of these other names that maybe we haven't talked about. Mm -hmm. Ooh, uh, we're looking at you. So I don't know. I mean, I think that this is something's got to change. I'd love to see a change across each line, a new forward, a new midi, a new back, yeah. a new outside back. It's it just is across good. the board. Let's it just make good. make a line change. All right. Well, that being said, uh, there has been some other murmurs. And as we wrap up, I just have like 10 other things to talk about. Just kidding. <laughs> There have been other things going on in the soccer world. We'll talk about those on Thursday. We'll have another guest joining us here on yeah. PHOI Union Podcast. Uh, we've actually got a lot of guests. So the next couple of weeks, we are tuned, having guys. a different guest every day. And we'll be tweeting out who that guest is going to be. You got to stick to it to find out who's going to do it. Um, that's a terrible <laughs> rhyme. But I just, it was the first rhyme that came. Not all of my rhymes can be good, guys. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was not great. Um, nothing to it but to do it. There you go. <laughs> so follow us so Bars. we can keep up yeah this is now this is the part where the show goes over an hour follow us to keep up with all the latest we're going to continue following what's dropping from the union in terms of schedules any oh, signings yeah. any moves that have been made um but it's a, it's right now a time of just being patient guys so as we are five days away from the start of training opening up uh we say thank you so much for tuning in to join us Tesho Akindeli joined us earlier, former Tesho. MLS player, current real estate developer with Camp North End out of Charlotte, uh, doing a fantastic job of just helping to create communities for families that make a difference. And I loved having a chance to chat with him, and we loved having a chance to chat with you guys. So 
Hit that thumbs up button on your way out the virtual door. Thanks for tuning in. Subscribe, like, comment. For those listening across podcast platforms, we appreciate you. And for Tyler Zuli, JP Zavada, myself, Renee Washington, so long. Have a great Tuesday, and we'll see you back Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, live right here on PHLI Union Podcast. Doop. We all silly like the mayor. 